So it's still national lockdown here in the UK and I'm having to film this from the comfort of my armchair. Now, I've always wanted to start a video like the famous YouTubers do, you know, with the one question I'm often asked opening. So let's give it a go. Now one question I'm often asked is, Phil, why are you so annoying? And I always give my wife the same reply. Tanya, I don't know what you mean. But I do know there are some simple steps you can take to capture stunning bird in flight photos. So let's take a look. Hello, I'm Phil Gower from Phil Gower Bird Photography. Now, capturing a great bird in flight image can be one of the most satisfying feelings in photography. And my hope is this video will help you have that feeling more often. So birds in flight or biff photography, my techniques, tips and tricks. But where do we start? Well, there's no better place to start than the six S's. And the first S stands for settings. Now I covered my camera settings for Biff Photography in my last video and it's well worth checking this video out and here's a link above. In the video I talk about the key settings for the Sony a7R4 but the advice is applicable to any modern camera system. In summary for Biff Photography I use continuous drive mode with the highest possible frame rate. This improves my chances of capturing a perfect wing position. I also use continuous focus mode because the bird is continuously moving and back button focus for greater focus control. I use the wide, zone, expand flexible spot and flexible spot focus areas but without tracking. As Sony AF develops and the bird eye tracking becomes more reliable I'm sure I'll start using the tracking modes. The rule of thumb for me at the moment is to use the smallest of these focus areas that does the job in hand. Invariably I use the zone focus area for most of my Biff shots at the moment. As I said, all of these settings are covered in the previous video, but I have a couple of other bits of advice for you. If you know roughly the range at which the bird will be flying, it pays to use your lens focus limiter accordingly. This will prevent your lens hunting throughout the focus range which can actually help you focus on the bird more quickly. Anything to get the killer shot. You could also help the AF system by pre-focusing on an object, like a tree or a bush, close to where you think you'll get the flight shot. This will help the lens snap onto the bird without focus hunting. You'll know from my previous video, I'm an advocate of shooting manual with auto ISO for birds in flight. In this mode, the camera sets the ISO and I have precise control over both the aperture and the shutter speed settings. Now this is perfect for flight photography. In terms of shutter speed, this obviously needs to be fast enough to deal with motion blur. I typically set this between 1 1250th for large flying birds and 1 3200th for fast, more agile birds. This range will cover most flight scenarios. 
Now I may need to up the shutter speed for really fast birds such as herondines like swallows and swifts, particularly if they are flying close. And that's a good point to remember, the closer the flying bird, the higher the shutter speed you'll need. It's also worth noting that while faster shutter speeds can result in higher keeper rates, it also means higher ISOs with more grain. So it's always a trade-off. I sometimes shoot at lower shutter speeds if there's not enough light, and unfortunately that happens a lot here in the UK. If you're good at panning, you can get some acceptable results with slower shutter speeds, especially if you're happy to have some motion blur at the wingtips. Now the feeling of speed this portrays can be really powerful in a flight image. In terms of f-stops, using high shutter speeds means you need to shoot with wide open apertures. I often shoot birds in flight at f4 on my 600mm for example. Although f4 provides a shallow depth of field, it's usually spot on if the subject is a small bird or a large bird some distance away. Now in these scenarios, if the eye is in focus, which is a must for all bird photography, the rest of the bird will be in acceptable focus. F4 also provides excellent background blur or bokeh and can make even busy backgrounds more attractive in the image. But what if the bird is flying close or your subject is a large bird with a large wingspan? In these instances, to get the eye and the rest of the bird in acceptable focus, you may need to stop down the aperture to say f6 or even to f8. So for birds in flight, my aperture is set between f4 and f8. To increase the reach of my gear, I often use the 1.4 times teleconverter with my Sony FE600. This makes the widest aperture 5.6. Now this combination with the added reach and the greater depth of field provided by f6 has worked really well and I'd certainly recommend it for birds in flight photography. Using manual mode with auto ISO means I can change shutter speed and aperture very quickly in the field without taking my eye away from the viewfinder. Such an important skill for birds in flight photography. And talking about skill, on to the second S, skill. Skill is often overlooked. But in my view, it's probably the most vital component of successful flight photography. What skill am I talking about? Well, it's hand-eye coordination. The hand-eye coordination needed to raise the camera to your eye and find the fast flying bird in the viewfinder and in an instant. Not to mention the skill of tracking the bird across the scene, keeping it in the viewfinder, keeping the focus air on it, and at the same time trying to create the perfect composition. It's not just skill, but high skill. I never underestimate just how difficult this can be. In my experience, the best BIF photographers are the ones who can get on the bird fast, giving the autofocus system a much better chance of acquiring focus before the bird has disappeared into the sunset. But there's good news in the old adage, practice makes perfect. Like most skills, it can be acquired and improved with the right amount of practice. You might recall a famous story about the golfer Gary Player that has no doubt become exaggerated over the years. Now Player was practicing at a greenside bunker when a man with a large hat walked by. Player chipped the ball out of the bunker, onto the green and straight into the hole. The man with a large hat bet Gary Player $50 he couldn't do it again. Player repeated the shot with the same result. The man with the large hat said, I wish I was as lucky as that at golf. And player retorted, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. So practice, practice, and practice some more. There are plenty of places like local parks and lakes you can practice on common, large and slow flying birds like crows, gulls and ducks. Now I started my working life as a teacher of physical education. I learned early on that great skill is built from a solid base. So think about the best stance and grip for birds in flight shots. Let's just pop outside and examine that in a bit more detail. Okay, you join me in my front garden um, on this cold uh, winter's afternoon, or certainly cold for uh, us softy southerners. Uh, let's talk about grip. Now, 
obviously I don't want to teach Granny to suck eggs here, uh, but essentially my, my grip, pretty standard, so one finger on the shutter release, that's the index finger, and my thumb on the back button for focus. Um, and in terms of holding the lens, um, just one hand underneath the barrel, so I get into that position and pretty much I use this every time I, I take a shot. So this is the grip. One thing I will point out that these uh, telephoto lenses have function buttons on the barrel and about a year ago I covered this lens or actually it was a Canon lens in this lens coat and forgot about these buttons and every now and again my focus wouldn't work because I was pressing the uh, focus hold button on the barrel so just be aware if you cover your buttons make sure you don't touch them inadvertently Rip. Uh, so and let's talk about stance so for flight photography in these large lenses you know you can easily become un unbalanced so a good idea to have your feet at least shoulder width apart so let's go back a bit at least shoulder width apart and if I'm facing this way to shoot at that sort of 90 degree angle, I put one foot forward and pretty much every time I raise the camera and I swivel the hips to trap the bird. So again, bird, raise the camera, swivel the hips, trap the bird. And that's pretty, you know, what it is, a, a solid grip a solid stance and you'll take some great pictures and really get that ingrained so you do the same thing every time. Okay, let's go back in. Once you have a solid grip and stance, work on raising the camera to your eye and locating a flying bird in the viewfinder, focusing and shooting. Use the same technique over and over again until it becomes ingrained and as quick as it can be. One tip, if you struggle to find the bird in the viewfinder, it might help to keep both eyes open, one eye looking through the viewfinder and the other locked onto the bird. This can help, and once you've mastered this skill, you'll find it easier to move to using just the one eye through the viewfinder. Give it a go if it helps. For me, birds in flight photography is much more about your skill than your equipment. So on to the third S, study. Plenty of study is important. Read books and magazines. Use the internet and bird sighting apps and develop a network of birding friends to help you find great subjects and great locations. Study birds to understand their habits and their behaviours and where you're likely to find them. You'll find birds at and around food sources drinking, roosting, courtship, displaying and nesting sites. Find these sites and you'll be presented with many opportunities for great flight images. But please observe the rules and regulations around photographing birds in and around their nests. The welfare of birds always comes first. Most birds exhibit certain behaviours before they take off. They might stretch their wings, shake their feathers, call out, lighten up by having a poo or simply rocking forward. Learn to recognise these behaviours for the species you encounter. Learn to anticipate takeoff. Takeoff shots are interesting in themselves, but the sooner you can get on a bird in flight, the better. The fourth S is for setup. Set up for success. When you've found a great location, set yourself up for great biff shots. Think about the sun and the wind and find the best place to position yourself. Ideally, position yourself with the sun to your back for well-lit flight shots. The golden hours provide the best lighting for flight shots with the sun low in the sky. Also, don't be afraid to experiment with backlit subjects. Light glowing through the feathers can be superb, but of course don't overdo it. Remember that birds like to take off into the wind for added lift. If you have the wind at your back, you might get some great head-on flight shots. And if you want great side-on panning shots, have the sun to your back and the wind coming from the side. Try to position yourself so you have an interesting yet clean background. Preferably not the sky or clouds, although it's easy on the autofocus with these backgrounds. You can't beat a flight shot with a clean background with wonderful bokeh. Try your best to shoot at eye level to the bird. 
you'll be rewarded with far more interesting, engaging and compelling shots. You might need to find high ground for this. Avoid taking too many underside or sky shots where possible. Just not so interesting in my view. I always try to be ready for flight shots if I'm walking about birding. I have my camera ready and set to f4 and 1 2,000th of a second. You typically have more time to adjust your settings for a perch bird shot than you do a flight shot. Hand hold the camera where possible. Remember, flight photography is high skill. Tripods can impede this skill in my view. So that brings us to the fifth and penultimate S, style. Always think about the style of flight image you want to take ahead of the photo session. Do you want a close detailed head-on shot? Or do you want a sideways panning shot? Or would a wider environmental shot be better? I have to say there are some great environmental flight shots to be had, and I use this style every now and again. But my usual style involves closer shooting, with the bird filling the frame, albeit through a crop in post-processing. When I compose the shot, I use the rule of thirds. The bird filling two thirds of the frame, with the eye on the line between the middle and outer third, giving the bird a third to fly into. This seems to work really well for me. I would say my best shots are with the bird either head on or flying directly past. Birds flying away, or our shots, don't normally make for great images, but there can be exceptions to this rule. Now pay attention to wing position in your flight shots. My preference is for extended wings at the top, to the side or all the way down. I always fire on continuous shooting drive mode with the highest frame rate to guarantee at least one perfect wing position from a sequence of shots. Okay, so on to the sixth and final S, which is story. <laughs> I have hundreds of bird in flight images in my portfolio and I'll leave a link below just in case you want to take a look. Most of these shots are technically sound. The eyes in focus, exposure is fine, depth of field allowing for enough of the bird to be in focus and motion blur eliminated other than maybe at the wingtip perhaps. But when I look back critically I realise many of these images could have been more dramatic and compelling. By telling more of a story in the image, by capturing additional behaviours. For example, hunting, displaying, courting, eating, fighting, calling, nesting, feeding and many more common bird behaviours. Here are some examples of the types of image I mean. Flight coupled with additional behaviours tells more of a meaningful story and makes the image far more attractive and compelling. So that's it for another video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you enjoyed it and would like to see more, then please like, comment and subscribe. I look forward to joining you in the next video. Stay safe and bye for now.